From the Conference Center in Salt Lake City, Utah, this is the Sunday morning session of the 191st Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with speakers selected from leaders of the church. Music for this session is provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. This broadcast is furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. President Henry B. Eyring, second counselor in the First Presidency of the Church, will conduct this session. Brothers and sisters, we welcome you <clears throat> to the Sunday morning session of the 191st Semiannual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. <clears throat> President Russell M. Nelson, who presides at the conference, has asked me to conduct this session. We extend our greetings and warm regards to those of you who are participating in the conference throughout the world by radio, television, the internet, or satellite transmission. We acknowledge the general authorities and the general officers who will be in attendance this morning and recognize a limited number seated on the stand. The music for this session will be provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square under the direction of Mac Wilberg and Ryan Murphy and Richard Elliott and Andrew Unsworth at the organ. We again note the reduced number of choir members in order to provide appropriate social distancing. All participants have been fully vaccinated against COVID-19 and were recently tested to ensure they are not infected with the virus. The choir opened this meeting with, come, rejoice, and will now favor us with sing praise to him. The invocation will then be offered by Elder David F. Evans, who was released yesterday afternoon from serving as a General Authority 70. The choir will then sing Where Love Is.
Our dear Father in heaven, as we begin another session of this general conference, we express our deep gratitude for the sessions yesterday and for the feelings and impressions which we had. We're grateful for our dear prophet, President Nelson, and his noble counselors, for the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, and for all of the general authorities and general officers of the Church. Father, as we listen today, we ask that we might be granted a measure of thy spirit that will help us to understand pure truth as it is taught and pure doctrine as we are taught and receive it. And most particularly, Father, we ask thee that thy spirit will help us to seek for and understand the answers to the questions of our hearts. We're so very grateful that we can gather together safely for this conference and wherever in the world we are, Father, we ask you to bless us that we might have thy spirit and have these blessings and every other blessing which is privately sought and which thou would give us to us. Again, we love thee and thank thee and are grateful to be here this day. And we say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
We will be now pleased to hear from Elder Dieter F. Uchtdorf of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He will be followed by Sister Camille N. Johnson, who serves as primary general president. Elder Dale G. Renland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles will then address us. We gather this beautiful Sabbath morning to speak of Christ, rejoice in his gospel, and support and sustain one another as we walk in the way of our Savior. As members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we assemble for this purpose every Sabbath day throughout the year. If you are not a member of the Church, we welcome you most warmly and thank you for joining with us to worship the Savior and learn of Him. Like you, we are striving, though imperfectly, to become better friends, neighbors, and human beings, and we seek to do this by following our exemplar, Jesus Christ. We hope you can feel the sincerity of our testimony. Jesus Christ lives. He is real. He is the Son of the living God, and He directs prophets on the earth in our day today as He is our dear prophet and president, Russell M. Nelson. We invite all to come, hear the word of God, and partake of His goodness. I bear my personal witness that God is among us, and that He will surely draw near to all who draw near to him. We consider it an honor to walk with you in the Master's straight and narrow path of discipleship. There's an oft-repeated theory that people who are lost walk in circles. Not long ago, scientists of the Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics tested that theory. They took participants to a thick forest and gave them simple instructions. Walk in a straight line. There were no visible landmarks. The test subjects had to rely solely on their sense of direction. How do you think they did? Well, the scientists concluded people really do walk in circles when they do not have reliable cues to their walking direction. When questioned afterwards, some participants self-confidently claimed that they had not deviated in the slightest. Despite their high confidence, GPS data showed that they walked in loops as tight as 20 meters in diameter. Why do we have such a hard time walking in a straight line? Some researchers hypothesize that small, seemingly insignificant deviations in terrain make the difference. Others have pointed to the fact that we all have one leg that is slightly stronger than the other. More likely, however, we struggle to, talk, to walk straight ahead because of increasing uncertainty about where straight ahead is. Whatever the cause, it is human nature. Without reliable landmarks, we drift off course. Isn't it interesting how small, seemingly insignificant factors can make a major difference in our lives? I know this from personal experience as a pilot. Every time I started the approach to an airport, I knew that much of my remaining work would consist of making constant minor course corrections to safely direct the aircraft to our desired landing runway. You may have similar experience when driving a vehicle. Wind, road irregularities, imperfect wheel alignment, inattentiveness, not to mention the actions of other drivers, all can push you off your intended path. Fail to pay attention to these factors and you may end up having a pretty bad day. 
This, of course, applies to us physically. It also applies to us spiritually. Most of the changes in our spiritual lives, both positive and negative, happen gradually, a step at a time. Like the participants in the Max Planck study, we may not realize when we veer off course. We may even have high confidence that we are walking a straight line. But the fact is that without the help of landmarks to guide us, we inevitably deviate off course and end up in places we never thought we would be. This is true for individuals. It is also true for societies and nations. The scriptures are filled with examples. The book of Judges records that after Joshua died, there arose another generation which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. Despite the astonishing heavenly interventions, visitations, rescues, and miraculous victories the children of Israel witnessed during the lifetime of Moses and Joshua, within a generation, the people had abandoned the way and began walking according to their own desires. And of course, it did not take long before they paid the price for that behavior. Sometimes this falling away takes generations. Sometimes it happens in a matter of years or even months. But we are all susceptible. No matter how strong our spiritual experiences have been in the past, as human beings, we tend to wander. That has been the pattern from the days of Adam until now. But all is not lost. Unlike the wandering test subjects, we have reliable, visible landmarks that we can use to evaluate our course. Now, what are these landmarks? Surely they include daily prayer and pondering the scriptures and using inspired tools like Come Follow Me. Each day we can approach the throne of God in humility and honesty. We can ponder our actions and review the moments of our day, considering our will and desires in light of His. If we have drifted, we plead with God to restore us and we commit to do better. This time of introspection is an opportunity for recalibration. It is a garden of reflection where we can walk with the Lord and be instructed, edified, and purified by the written and spirit-revealed word of our Heavenly Father. It is a sacred time when we remember our solemn covenants to follow the living Christ. When we assess our progress, and align ourselves with the spiritual landmarks God has provided for his children. Think of it as your personal daily restoration. On our journey as pilgrims on the path of glory, we know how easy it is to fall away. But just as minor deviations can draw us out of the Savior's way, so can two small and simple acts of realignment assuredly lead us back. When darkness creeps into our lives, it is often thus, our daily restoration opens our hearts to heavenly light, which illuminates our souls chasing away shadows, fears, and doubts. If we seek it, surely God shall give unto us knowledge by his Holy Spirit, yea, by the unspeakable gift of the Holy Ghost. As often as we ask, he will teach us the way and help us follow it. This, of course, takes steady effort on our part we cannot be content with spiritual experiences of the past. We need a steady flow. 
We can't rely on others' testimonies forever. We must build our own. We need on an ongoing, daily infusion of heavenly light. We need times of refreshing, times of personal restoration. Rolling waters cannot long remain impure, says the scriptures. To keep our thoughts and actions pure, we have, have to keep rolling. After all, the restoration of the gospel and the church is not something that happened once and is over. It is an ongoing process, one day at a time, one heart at a time. As our days go, so go our lives. One author put it this way, a day is like a whole life. You start out going, doing one thing, but end up doing something else. Plan to run an errand, but never get it there. And at the end of your life, your whole existence has the same random quality too. Your whole life has the shape of a single day. Do you want to change the shape of your life? Change the shape of your day. Do you want to change your day? Change this hour. Change what you think, feel, and do at the very moment. A small rudder can steer a large ship. Small bricks can become magnificent mansions. Small seeds can become towering sequoias. Minutes and hours well spent are the building blocks of a life well lived. They can inspire goodness, lift us from the captivity of imperfections, and lead us upwards to the redemptive path of forgiveness and sanctification. With you, I lift my heart in gratitude for the magnificent gift of new opportunity, new life, new hope. We lift our voices in praise of our bountiful and forgiving God, for surely he is a God of new beginnings. The sublime end of all his labor is to help us, his children, succeed in our quest for immortality and eternal life. We can become new creatures in Christ, for God has promised, as often as my people repent, I will forgive them their trespasses against me and remember them no more. My beloved brothers and sisters, dear friends, we all drift from time to time, but we can back on course. We can navigate our way through the darkness and trials of this life and find our way back to our loving Heavenly Father if we seek and accept the spiritual landmarks He has provided and praise personal revelation and strive for daily restoration. This is how we become true disciples of our beloved Savior Jesus Christ. As we do so, God will smile upon us the Lord shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The Lord shall establish thee and holy people unto himself, that we will seek daily restoration and continually strive to walk in the way of Jesus Christ is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I begin by posing several questions meant for self-reflection. What kind of personal narrative are you writing for your life? Is the path you describe in your story straight? Does your story end where it began at your heavenly home? Is there an exemplar in your story? And is it the Savior, Jesus Christ? I testify that the Savior is the author and finisher of our faith. Will you invite him to be the author and finisher of your story? He knows the beginning from the end. He was the creator of heaven and earth. He wants us to return home to him and our heavenly father. He has everything invested in us and wants us to succeed. 
What do you suppose keeps us from turning our stories over to him? Perhaps this illustration will help your self-assessment. An effective trial lawyer knows that on cross-examination, you should rarely ask a witness a question to which you do not know the answer. Asking such a question is inviting the witness to tell you and the judge and jury something you don't already know. You might get an answer that surprises you and is contrary to the narrative you have developed for your case. Although asking a witness a question to which you do not know the answer is generally unwise for a trial lawyer, the opposite is true for us. We can ask questions of our loving Heavenly Father in the name of our merciful Savior, and the witness who answers our questions is the Holy Ghost, who always testifies of truth. Because the Holy Ghost works in perfect unity with Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ, we know that the manifestations of the Holy Ghost are reliable. Why then are we sometimes resistant to asking for this kind of heavenly help? Truth manifests to us by the Holy Ghost. Why do we put off asking a question to which we do not know the answer when the witness is not only friendly, but will always tell the truth? Perhaps it is because we don't have the faith to accept the answer we might receive. Perhaps it is because the natural man or woman in us is resistant to turning things completely over to the Lord and trusting Him entirely. Maybe that is why we choose to stick with the narrative we have written for ourselves, a comfortable version of our story, unedited by the master author. We don't want to get a, ask a question and get an answer that doesn't fit neatly into the story we are writing for ourselves. Frankly, few of us would probably write into our stories the trials that refine us. But don't we love the glorious culmination of a story we read when the protagonist overcomes the struggle? Trials are the elements of the plot that make our favorite stories compelling, timeless, faith-promoting, and worthy of telling. The beautiful struggles written into our stories are what draw us closer to the Savior and refine us, making us more like Him. For David to overcome Goliath, the boy had to take on the giant. The comfortable narrative for David would have been a return to tending sheep. But instead, he reflected upon his experience saving lambs from a lion and a bear and building on those heroic feats, he mustered the faith and courage to let God write his story, declaring, The Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. With a desire to let God prevail, with an ear to the Holy Ghost, and a willingness to let the Savior be the author and finisher of his story, the boy David defeated Goliath and saved his people. The sublime principle of agency does, of course, allow us to write our own stories. David could have gone home, back to tending sheep. But Jesus Christ stands ready to use us as divine instruments, sharpened pencils in his hand to write a masterpiece. He is mercifully willing to use me, a scrawny pencil, as an instrument in his hands if I have the faith to let him, if I will let him author my story. Esther is another beautiful example of letting God prevail. Rather than sticking with a cautious narrative of self-preservation, she exercised faith, turning herself completely over to the Lord. Haman was plotting the destruction of all the Jews in Persia. Mordecai, Esther's relative, became aware of the plot and wrote to her, urging her to talk with the king on behalf of her people. She recounted to him that one who approaches the king without being summoned was subject to death. But in a tremendous act of faith, she asked Mordecai to gather the Jews and fast for her. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, she said, and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. Esther was willing to let the Savior write her story, even though through the lens of mortality, the ending may have been tragic. Blessedly, the king received Esther, and the Jews in Persia were saved. Of course, Esther's level of courage is rarely asked of us, 
But letting God prevail, letting him be the author and finisher of our stories does require us to keep his commandments and the covenants we have made. It is our commandment and covenant keeping that will open the line of communication for us to receive revelation through the Holy Ghost. And it is through the manifestations of the Spirit that we will fill the Master's hand, writing our stories with us. In April 2020, our prophet, President Russell M. Nelson, asked us to consider what we could do if we had more faith in Jesus Christ. With more faith in Jesus Christ, we could ask a question to which we do not know the answer. Ask our Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus Christ, to send an answer through the Holy Ghost who testifies of truth. If we had more faith, we would ask the question and then be willing to accept the answer we receive, even if it doesn't fit our comfortable narrative. And the promised blessing that will come from acting in faith in Jesus Christ is an increase in faith in him as our author and finisher. President Nelson declared that we receive more faith by doing something that requires more faith. So a childless couple suffering with infertility may ask in faith whether they should adopt children and be willing to accept the answer, even though the narrative they had written for themselves included a miraculous birth. A senior couple may ask whether it is time for them to serve a mission and be willing to go, even though the narrative they had written for themselves included more time in the workforce. Or maybe the answer will be not yet, and they will learn in later chapters of their story why they were needed at home a little bit longer. A teenaged young man or young woman may ask in faith whether a pursuit of sports or academics or music is of most value and be willing to follow the promptings of the perfect witness, the Holy Ghost. Why do we want the Savior to be the author and the finisher of our stories? Because he knows our potential perfectly. He will take us to places we never imagined ourselves. He may make us a David or an Esther. He will stretch us and refine us to be more like him. The things we will achieve as we act with more faith will increase our faith in Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, just one year ago, our dear prophet asked, are you willing to let God prevail in your life? Are you willing to let whatever he needs you to do take precedence over every other ambition? I humbly add to those prophetic inquiries, Will you let God be the author and finisher of your story? In Revelation, we learn that we will stand before God and be judged out of the books of life according to our works. We will be judged by our book of life. We can choose to write a comfortable narrative for ourselves, or we can allow the master author and finisher to write our story with us letting the role he needs us to play take precedence over other ambitions. Let Christ be the author and finisher of your story. Let the Holy Ghost be your witness. Write a story in which the path you are on is straight, on a course leading you back to your heavenly home to live in the presence of God. Let the adversity and affliction that's part of every good story be a means by which you draw closer to and become more like Jesus Christ. Tell a story in which you recognize the heavens are open. Ask questions to which you do not know the answer, knowing God is willing to make known his will for you through the Holy Ghost. Let your narrative be one of faith, following your exemplar, the Savior, Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, Sister Johnson. My dear brothers and sisters, during an exercise stress test, the heart's workload is increased. Hearts that can handle walking may struggle to support the demands of running uphill. In this way, the stress test can reveal underlying disease that's not otherwise apparent. Any issues identified can be treated before they become serious problems in daily life. The COVID-19 pandemic has certainly been a global stress test. The test has shown mixed results. Safe and effective vaccines have been developed. 
medical professionals, teachers, caregivers, and others have sacrificed heroically and continue to do so. Many people have displayed generosity and kindness and continue to do so. Yet, underlying disadvantages have been manifest. Vulnerable individuals have suffered and continue to do so. Those who work to address these underlying inequalities are to be encouraged and thanked. The pandemic is also a spiritual stress test for the Savior's Church and its members. The results are likewise mixed. Our lives have been blessed by ministering in a higher and holier way, the Come, Follow Me curriculum, and home-centered, Church-supported gospel learning. Many have provided compassionate help and comfort during these difficult times and continue to do so. Yet, in some instances, the spiritual stress test has shown tendencies toward contention and divisiveness. This suggests that we have work to do to change our hearts and to become unified as the Savior's true disciples. This isn't a new challenge, but it is a critical one. When the Savior visited the Nephites, He taught, There shall be no disputations among you. He that hath the spirit of contention is not of me, but is of the devil, who is the father of contention, and he stirreth up the hearts of men to contend with anger, one with another. When we contend with anger uh, against each other, Satan laughs and the God of heaven weeps. Satan laughs and God weeps for at least two reasons. First, contention weakens our collective witness to the world of Jesus Christ and the redemption that comes through His merits, mercy, and grace. The Savior said, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. The converse is also true. Everyone knows that we're not his disciples when we don't show love one to another. His latter-day work is compromised when contention or enmity exists among his disciples. Second, Contention is spiritually unhealthy for us as individuals. We're robbed of peace, joy, and rest, and our ability to feel the Spirit is compromised. Jesus explained that His doctrine was not to stir up the hearts of men with anger one against another, but that His doctrine is that such things should be done away. If I'm quick to take offense, or respond to differences of opinion by becoming angry or judgmental, I fail the spiritual stress test. This failed test doesn't mean that I'm hopeless. Rather, it points out that I need to change. And that's good to know. After the Savior's visit to the Americas, the people were unified. There was no contention in all the land. Do you think that the people were unified because they were all the same or because they had no differences of opinion? I doubt it. Instead, contention and enmity disappeared because they placed their discipleship of the Savior above all else. Their differences paled in comparison to their shared love of the Savior, and they were united as heirs to the kingdom of God. The result was that there could not be a happier people who had been created by the hand of God. Unity requires effort. It develops when we cultivate the love of God in our hearts and we focus on our eternal destiny. We're united by our common primary identity as children of God and our commitment to the truths of the restored gospel. In turn, our love of God and our discipleship of Jesus Christ generate genuine concern for others. We value the kaleidoscope of others' characteristics, perspectives, and talents. If we are unable to place our discipleship of Jesus Christ above personal interests and viewpoints, we should reexamine our priorities and change. We might be inclined to say, of course we can have unity 
if only you would agree with me. A better approach is to ask, what can I do to foster unity? How can I respond to help this person draw closer to Christ? What can I do to lessen contention and to build a compassionate and caring Church community? When love of Christ envelops our lives, we approach disagreements with meekness, patience, and kindness. We worry less about our own sensitivities and more about our neighbors. We seek to moderate and unify. We don't engage in doubtful disputations, judge those with whom we disagree, or try to cause them to stumble. Instead, we assume that those with whom we disagree are doing the best they can with the life experiences they have. My wife practiced law for over 20 years. As an attorney, she often worked with others who explicitly advocated opposing views, but she learned to disagree without being rude or angry. She might say to opposing counsel, I can see we're not going to agree on this issue. I like you. I respect your opinion. I hope you can offer me the same courtesy. Often, this allowed for mutual respect and even friendship despite differences. Even former enemies can become united in their discipleship of the Savior. In 2006, I attended the dedication of the Helsinki Finland Temple to honor my father and grandparents who had been early converts to the Church in Finland. Finns, including my father, had dreamed of a temple in Finland for decades. At the time, the temple district would encompass Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Belarus, and Russia. At the dedication, I learned something surprising. The first day of general operation had been set aside for Russian members to perform temple ordinances. It's difficult to explain just how astonishing this was. Russia and Finland had fought many wars over the centuries. My father distrusted and disliked not only Russia, but all Russians. He had expressed such feelings passionately, and his feelings were typical of Finnish enmity toward Russia. He had memorized epic poems that chronicled 19th century warfare between Finns and Russians. His experiences during World War II, when Finland and Russia were again antagonists, did nothing to change his opinion. A year before the dedication of the Helsinki Finland Temple, the Temple Committee, consisting exclusively of Finnish members, met to discuss plans for the dedication. During the meeting, someone observed that Russian saints would be traveling several days to attend the dedication and might hope to receive their temple blessings before returning home. The committee chairman, Brother Sven Eklund, suggested that the Finns could wait a little longer, that Russians could be the first members to perform temple ordinances in the temple. All committee members agreed. Faithful Latter-day Saint Finns delayed their temple blessings to accommodate Russian saints. The area president who was present at that temple committee meeting, Elder Dennis B. Neunschwander, later wrote, I have never been prouder of the Finns than I was at this moment. Finland's difficult history with its eastern neighbor and their excitement of finally having a temple constructed on their own soil were put aside. Permitting the Russians to enter the temple first was a statement of love and sacrifice. When I reported this kindness to my father, his heart melted and he wept, a very rare occurrence for that stoic Finn. From that time until his death three years later, he never expressed another negative sentiment about Russia. Inspired by the example of his fellow Finns, my father chose to place his discipleship of Jesus Christ 
above all other considerations. The Finns were no less Rus Finnish. The Russians were no less Russian. Neither group abandoned their culture, history, or experiences to banish enmity. They didn't need to. Instead, they chose to make their discipleship of Jesus Christ their primary consideration. If they can do it, so can we. We can bring our heritage, culture, and experiences to the Church of Jesus Christ. Samuel didn't shy away from his heritage as a Lamanite, nor did Mormon shy away from his as a Nephite. But each put his discipleship of the Savior first. If we're not one, we're not his. My invitation is to be valiant in putting our love of God and discipleship of the Savior above all other considerations. Let's uphold the covenant inherent in our discipleship, the covenant to be one. Let's follow the example of saints from around the world who are successfully becoming disciples of Christ. We can rely on Jesus Christ, who is our peace, who hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his atoning sacrifice the enmity. Our witness of Jesus Christ to the world will be strengthened, and we will remain spiritually healthy. I testify that as we shun contention and become like-minded with the Lord in love and united with Him in faith, His peace will be ours. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. The congregation will now join the choir in singing, I am a child of God. After singing, we will hear from Elder Vahanina Sekehema of the 70. Following his remarks, Elder Quinton L. Cook of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles will speak. This is the Sunday morning session of the 191st Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints.
In my professional life and in my service in the church, I have done this thousands of times, just never before the 15 men seated directly behind me. I feel your prayers and theirs. Brothers and sisters, I am a native of the Kingdom of Tonga in the South Pacific, but was raised in North America. The pandemic has kept hundreds, perhaps thousands, of young Tongan missionaries serving around the world from returning to their beloved homeland because of its closed borders. Some Tongan elders have been on their missions for three years, and sisters over two years. They wait patiently with the faith for which our people are known. Meanwhile, don't be too alarmed if some of them serving in your wards and stakes are looking increasingly more like me, aging and gray. We are grateful for, their, for missionaries everywhere for their devoted service, even when longer or shorter than they had anticipated because of the pandemic. One Sunday when I was a deacon, I was in the foyer with a tray of water passing the sacrament when a woman had just walked into the building. Dutifully, I approached and I handed her the tray. She nodded, smiled, and took a cup of water. She had arrived too late to receive the bread. Shortly after this experience, my home teacher, Ned Brimley, taught me that many aspects and blessings of the gospel of Jesus Christ are given to us in sequential order. Later that week, Ned Brimley and his companion came to our home with a memorable lesson. Ned reminded us that there was order to how God created the earth. And the Lord took great care in explaining to Moses the order in which he created the earth. First, he started by dividing the light from the darkness, and then water from the dry land. He added plant life and animals before introducing to the newly formed planet his greatest creation, humankind, beginning with Adam and Eve. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he them, he him. Male and female created he them. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. The Lord was pleased, and he rested on the seventh day. The sequential order in which the earth was created not only gives us a glimpse of what is most important to God, but also why and for whom he created the earth. Ned Brimley punctuated his inspired lesson with a simple statement. Vi, God's house is one of order. He expects you to live your life with order, in proper sequence. He wants you to serve a mission before you get married. To this point, church leaders currently teach that the Lord expects each able young man to prepare to serve. Young women who desire to serve should also prepare. Brother Brimley continued, God wants you to get married before you have children. and. He wants you to continually develop your talents as you earn an education. If you choose to live your life out of sequence, you will find life more difficult and chaotic. Brother Brimley also taught us that through his atoning sacrifice, the Savior helps us to restore order to our lives made chaotic or out of sequence by our own or others' poor choices. From that time on, I've had a fascination with sequential order. I developed a habit of looking for sequential patterns in life and in the gospel. Elder David A. Bednar taught this principle. As we study, learn, and live the gospel of Jesus Christ, sequence often is instructive. Consider, for example, the lessons we learn about the spiritual priorities from the order of the major events that occurred as the fullness of the Savior's gospel was restored in these latter days. Elder Bednar listed the first vision and Moroni's initial appearance to Joseph Smith as teaching the boy prophet, first, the nature and character of God, followed by the role the Book of Mormon and Elijah would play in gathering Israel on both sides of the veil in this last dispensation. Elder Bednar concludes, this inspiring sequence is instructive about the spiritual matters of highest priority to deity, close quote. One observation I've made is that sequential order is a simple, natural, and effective way for the Lord to teach us, as His children, important principles. 
We've come to Earth to learn and gain experience we would not otherwise have. Our growth is unique to each of us individually and a vital component of Heavenly Father's plan. Our physical and spiritual growth begins in stages and develops slowly as we gain experience sequentially. Alma gives a powerful sermon on faith, drawing on the analogy of a seed which, if tended and nourished properly, sprouts from a small sapling into a full-grown, mature tree that produces delicious fruit. The lesson is that your faith will increase as you give place for and nourish the seed, or the Word of God, in your hearts. Your faith will increase as the Word of God begins to swell within your breasts. That it swelleth and sprouteth and beginneth to grow is both visual and instructive. It is also sequential. The Lord teaches us individually according to our capacity to learn and how we learn. Our growth is entirely dependent on our willingness, our natural curiosity, our level of faith and understanding. Nephi was taught what Joseph Smith would learn in Kirtland, Ohio, over 2,300 years later. For behold, thus saith the Lord, I will give unto the children of men, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. And blessed are those who hearken unto my precepts, and lend an ear unto my counsel, for they shall learn wisdom. That we learn line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, is again sequential. Consider the following statements we've heard most of our lives. First things first, or feed them milk before meat. How about we have to walk before we run? Each of these axioms describes something that is sequential. Miracles operate according to sequential order. Miracles occur when we first exercise faith. Faith precedes the miracle. Aaronic priesthood offices are also ordained in sequence according to the age of the one being ordained. Deacon, teacher, and then priest. The ordinances of salvation and exaltation are sequential in nature. We are baptized prior to receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. Temple ordinances are sequential, similarly sequential. Of course, as my friend Ned Brimley so wisely taught me, the sacrament is sequential. It begins with the bread, followed by the water. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. In Jerusalem and in the Americas, the Savior instituted the sacrament in the exact same order. Behold, mine house is a house of order, saith the Lord God, and not a house of confusion. Repentance is sequential. It begins with faith in Jesus Christ, even if just a particle. Faith requires humility, which is an essential element of having a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Indeed, the first four principles of the gospel are sequential. We believe that the first principles and ordinances of the gospel are, first, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, second, repentance, third, baptism by immersion for the remission of sins, fourth, laying out of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. King Benjamin taught his people this important truth, and see that all these things are done in wisdom and order, for it is not requisite that a man should run faster than he has strength. And again, it is expedient that he should be diligent, that thereby he might win the prize. Therefore, all things must be done in order. May we live our lives with order and seek to follow the sequence the Lord has outlined for us. We will be blessed as we look for and follow the patterns and the sequence in which the Lord teaches what's most important to Him. In the sacred name of Jesus Christ, amen. I was recently assigned to dedicate a portion of Historic Nauvoo. As part of the assignment, I was able to visit Liberty Jail in Missouri. As I viewed the jail, I contemplated the events that
that make it such a significant part of church history. The lives of the saints were threatened as a result of an extermination order issued by the governor of Missouri. In addition, the prophet Joseph and a few choice associates had been unjustly imprisoned in Liberty Jail. One of the reasons for the violent opposition to our members was most of them were opposed to slavery. This intense persecution of Joseph Smith and his followers constitutes an extreme example of the unrighteous exercise of agency that can impact righteous people. Joseph's time in Liberty Jail demonstrates that adversity is not evidence of the Lord's disfavor nor a withdrawal of His blessings. I was deeply moved as I read what the Prophet Joseph Smith declared as he was confined in Liberty Jail. O God, where art thou? And where is the pavilion that covereth thy hiding place? Joseph inquired how long the Lord's people would suffer these wrongs and unlawful oppressions. As I stood in Liberty Jail, I was dip deeply touched as I read the Lord's answer. My son, peace be unto thy soul. Thine adversity and thine afflictions shall be but a small moment. And then, if thou endure it well, God shall exalt thee on high. It is clear that opposition can refine us for an eternal celestial destiny. The Savior's precious words, My son, peace be unto thy soul, resonate with me personally and have great significance for our day. They remind me of his teachings to his disciples during his mortal ministry. Prior to Christ's suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross, he commanded his apostles to love one another as I have loved you, and subsequently comforted them with these words, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. One of the most cherished titles of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is Prince of Peace. Ultimately, His kingdom will be established, including peace and love. We look forward to the millennial reign of the Messiah. Notwithstanding this vision of the millennial reign, we know that world peace and harmony are not prevalent in our day. In my lifetime, I have never seen a greater lack of civility. We are bombarded with angry, contentious language and provocative, devastating actions that destroy peace and tranquility. Peace in the world is not promised or assured until the second coming of Jesus Christ. The Savior instructed his, his apostles that his earthly mission would not achieve universal peace. He taught, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. Universal peace was not part of the Savior's initial mortal ministry. Universal peace does not exist today. However, personal peace can be achieved despite the anger, contention, and division that blights and corrupts our world today. It has never been more important to seek personal peace. A beautiful and beloved new hymn written for today's youth by Brother Nick Day titled Peace in Christ declares, When there's no peace on earth, there is peace in Christ. We were blessed to have this hymn just before the worldwide COVID-19 pandemic. This hymn, hymn reflects in a beautiful fashion the aspiration for peace and appropriately emphasizes that peace is anchored in the life and mission of Jesus Christ. President Joseph F. Smith declared, there never can come to the world that spirit of peace and love until mankind will receive God's truth and God's message and acknowledge His power and authority, which is divine. 
While we will never retreat from efforts to achieve universal peace, we have been assured that we can have personal peace as Christ teaches. This principle is set forth in the Doctrine and Covenants. But learn that he who doeth the works of righteousness shall receive his reward, even peace in this world and eternal life in the world to come. What are some of the works of righteousness that will help us deal with disputations and lessen contention and find peace in this world? All of Christ's teachings point in this direction. I will mention a few which I believe are particularly important. <clears throat> First, love God, live His commandments, and forgive everyone. President George Albert Smith became president of the Church in 1945. He had been known during his years as an apostle, as a peace-loving leader. In the preceding 15 years before he became president, the challenges and trials of a massive worldwide depression followed by the death and destruction of World War II, had been anything but peaceful. At the conclusion of World War II, during his first general conference as president in October 1945, President Smith reminded the saints of the Savior's invitation to love their neighbors and forgive their enemies, and then taught, that is the spirit all Latter-day Saints should seek to possess if they hope someday to stand in His presence and receive at His hands a glorious welcome home. Second, seek the fruits of the Spirit. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul, in his epistle to the Galatians, sets forth the dichotomy between works of righteousness that qualify us to inherit the kingdom of God and works that can, without repentance, disqualify us. Among those that qualify us are the fruits of the Spirit, <clears throat> love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Paul also includes be bearing one another's burdens and being not weary in well-doing. Among those works that are not righteous, he includes hatred, wrath, and strife. One of the great lessons in the Old Testament period relates to Father Abraham. Abraham and Lot, his nephew, were wealthy, but found they could not dwell together. To eliminate strife, Abraham allowed Lot to choose the land he wanted. Lot chose the plain of Jordan, which was both well-watered and beautiful. Abraham took the less fertile plain of Mamre. The scriptures read that Abraham then pitched his tent, and built an altar unto the Lord. Lot, on the other hand, pitched his tent towards Sodom. The lesson is clear. We should be willing to compromise and eliminate strife with respect to matters that do not involve righteousness to have peaceful relationships. As King Benjamin taught, you will not have a mind to injure one another, but to live peaceably. But on conduct relating to righteousness and doctrinal imperatives, we need to remain firm and steadfast. If we want to have the peace which is the reward of the works of righteousness, we will not pitch our tents towards the world. We will pitch our tents towards the temple. Third exercise, agency to choose righteousness. Peace and agency are intertwined as essential elements of the plan of salvation. As described in the gospel topic on agency and accountability, agency is the ability and privilege God gives us to choose and to act for ourselves. Thus, agency is at the heart of the personal growth and experience that blesses us as we follow the Savior. Agency was a principal issue in the premortal council in heaven and the conflict between those who chose to follow Christ and the followers of Satan. Letting go of pride and control and choosing the Savior would allow us to have His light and His peace. But personal peace would be challenged when people exercise their agency in harmful and hurtful ways. I am confident that the peaceful assurance we felt in our hearts 
was strengthened by the knowledge we had of what the Savior of the world would accomplish in our behalf. This is beautifully set forth in Preach My Gospel, quote, as we rely on the atonement of Jesus Christ, he can help us endure our trials, sicknesses, and pain. We can be filled with joy, peace, and consolation. All that is unfair about life can be made right through the atonement of Jesus Christ." End quote. Fourth, build Zion in our hearts and homes. We are children of God and part of His family. We are also part of the family into which we are born. The institution of the family is the foundation for both happiness and peace. President Russell M. Nelson has taught us, and during this pandemic we have learned, that the home-centered, church-supported religious observance can unleash the power of families to transform our homes into a sanctuary of faith. If we have this religious observance in our homes, we will also have the Savior's peace. We are aware that many of you do not have the blessings of righteous homes and contend regularly with those who choose unrighteousness. The Savior can provide protection and peace to guide you ultimately to safety and shelter from life's storms. I assure you that the joy, love, and fulfillment experienced in loving, righteous families produces both peace and happiness. Love and kindness are at the center of having Zion in our hearts and homes. Fifth, follow the current admonitions of our prophet. Our peace is greatly enhanced when we follow the Lord's prophet, President Russell M. Nelson. We will shortly have an opportunity to hear from him. He was prepared from the foundations of the world for this calling. His personal preparation has been most remarkable. He has taught us that we can feel enduring peace and joy, even during turbulent times, as we strive to become more like our Savior, Jesus Christ. He has counseled us to repent daily to receive the Lord's cleansing, healing, and strengthening power. I am a personal witness that revelation has been received and continues to be received from heaven by our beloved prophet. While we honor and sustain him as our prophet, we worship our Heavenly Father and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We are ministered to by the Holy Ghost. I testify and provide my personal apostolic witness that Jesus Christ, the Savior and Redeemer of the world, leads and guides His restored Church. His life and atoning mission are the true source of peace. He is the Prince of Peace. I bear my sure and solemn witness that He lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We are grateful to the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square for the beautiful music they have provided this morning and for all who have spoken to us thus far. The choir will now favor us with how firm a foundation. The concluding speaker for this session will be our beloved prophet, President Russell M. Nelson. President Nelson's remarks after the will close the meeting. The choir will then sing, let the mountains shout for joy. The benediction will then be offered by Sister Jean B. Bingham, who serves as Relief Society General President.
My dear brothers and sisters, I'm grateful to be with you this morning to share the feelings of my heart. As you know, we are performing major renovations on the historic Salt Lake Temple. This complex project includes major reinforcement of its original foundation, which has served well for more than a century but this temple must stand much longer. In late May, I inspected the progress on this massive project. I thought you would appreciate seeing what my wife Wendy and I saw. I think you will see why the hymn, How Firm a Foundation, has come to have new meaning for us. We are looking at the original foundation of the Salt Lake Temple. I'm standing in an area beneath what was the garden room. As I examine the craftsmanship of this entire building, I marvel at what the pioneers accomplished. I am totally in awe when I consider that they built this magnificent temple with only tools and techniques available to them more than a century ago. These many decades later, however, if we examine the foundation closely, we can see the effects of erosion, gaps in the original stonework, and varying stages of stability in the masonry. Now, as I witness what modern engineers, architects, and construction experts can do, to reinforce that original foundation. I am absolutely amazed. Their work is astonishing. The foundation of any building, particularly one as large as this one, must be strong and resilient enough to withstand earthquakes, corrosion, high winds, and the inevitable settling that affects all buildings. The complex task of strengthening now underway will reinforce this sacred temple with a foundation that can and will stand the test of time. We are sparing no effort to give this venerable temple, which had become increasingly vulnerable, 
a foundation that will withstand the forces of nature into the millennium. In like manner, it is now time that we each implement extraordinary measures, perhaps measures we have never taken before, to strengthen our personal, spiritual foundations. Unprecedented times call for unprecedented measures. My dear brothers and sisters, these are the latter days. If you and I are to withstand the forthcoming perils and pressures, it is imperative that we each have a firm spiritual foundation built upon the rock of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. So I ask each of you, how firm is your foundation? And what reinforcements to your testimony and understanding of the gospel are needed? The temple lies at the center of strengthening our faith and spiritual fortitude because the Savior and his doctrine are the very heart of the temple. Everything taught in the temple through instruction and through the Spirit increases our understanding of Jesus Christ. His essential ordinances bind us to him through sacred priesthood covenants. Then as we keep our covenants, he endows us with his healing, strengthening power. And oh, how we will need his power in the days ahead. We have been promised that if we are prepared, we shall not fear. This assurance has profound implications today. The Lord has declared that despite today's unprecedented challenges, those who build their foundations upon Jesus Christ and have learned how to draw upon his power need not succumb to the unique anxieties of this era. Temple ordinances and covenants are ancient. The Lord instructed Adam and Eve to pray, make covenants, and offer sacrifices. Indeed, whenever the Lord has had a people on the earth who will obey his word, they have been commanded to build temples. The standard works are replete with references to temple teachings, clothing, language, and more. Everything we believe and every promise God has made to his covenant people come together in the temple. In every age, the temple has underscored the precious truth that those who make covenants with God and keep them are children of the covenant. Thus, in the house of the Lord, we can make the same covenants with God that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob made, and we can receive the same blessings. Temples have been part of this dispensation from its earliest days. Elijah committed the keys of sealing authority to Joseph Smith in the Kirtland Temple. The fullness of the priesthood was restored in the Nauvoo Temple. Until his martyrdom, Joseph Smith continued to receive revelations that furthered the restoration of the endowment and sealing ordinances. He recognized, however, that further refinement was needed. After administering the endowment to Brigham Young in May 1842, Joseph told Brigham, this is not arranged right. 
but we've done the best we could under the circumstances in which we were placed. And I wish you to take this matter in hand and organize and systematize all these ceremonies." Close quote. Well, following the prophet's death, President Young oversaw the completion of the Nauvoo Temple and later built temples in the Utah Territory. At the dedication of the lower stories of the St. George Temple, Brigham Young vigorously declared the urgency of vicarious temple work when he said, when I think upon this subject, I want the tongues of seven thunders to wake up the people. From that time forward, temple ordinances were gradually refined. President Harold B. Lee explained why procedures, policies, and even the administration of temple ordinances continue to change within the Savior's restored church. President Lee said, the principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ are divine. Nobody changes the principles and doctrine of the church except the Lord by revelation. But methods change as the inspired direction comes to those who preside at a given time. Close quote. Well, consider how administering the sacrament has changed over the years. In earlier days, the water of the sacrament was offered to the congregation in one large vessel. Everyone drank from it. Now, we use individual disposable cups. The procedure changed, but the covenants remain the same. Ponder these three truths. One, the restoration is a process, not an event, and will continue until the Lord comes again. Two, the ultimate objective of the gathering of Israel is to bring the blessings of the temple to God's faithful children. And three, as we seek how to accomplish that objective more effectively, the Lord reveals more insights. The ongoing restoration needs ongoing revelation. The First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles have often asked the Lord, if there are better ways to take the blessings of the temple to his faithful children. We seek guidance regularly on how to ensure worldwide accuracy and consistency of temple instruction, covenants, and ordinances, despite differences in language and culture. Under the Lord's direction and in answer to our prayers, recent procedural adjustments have been made. He is the one who wants you to understand with great clarity exactly what you are making covenants to do. He is the one who wants you to experience fully his sacred ordinances. He wants you to comprehend your privileges, promises, and responsibilities. He wants you to have spiritual insights and awakenings you've never had before. This he desires for all temple patrons, no matter where they live. Current adjustments in temple procedures and others that will follow are continuing evidence that the Lord is actively directing his church. He is providing opportunities for each of us to bolster our spiritual foundations more effectively by centering our lives on him and on the ordinances and covenants of his temple. 
When you bring your temple recommend, a contrite heart, and a seeking mind to the Lord's house of learning, he will teach you. Should distance, health challenges, or other constraints prohibit your temple attendance for a season, I invite you to set a regular time to rehearse in your mind the covenants you have made. If you don't yet love to attend the temple, go more often, not less. Let the Lord, through His Spirit, teach and inspire you there. I promise you that over time, the temple will become a place of safety, solace, and revelation. If it were possible for me to speak one-on-one -on -one with every young adult, I would plead with you to seek a companion with whom you can be sealed in the temple. You may wonder what difference this will make in your life. I promise it will make all the difference. As you marry in the temple and return repeatedly, you will be strengthened and guided in your decisions. If I could speak with each husband and wife who have still not been sealed in the temple, I would plead with you to take the necessary steps to receive that crowning, life-saving ordinance. Will it make a difference? Only if you want to progress forever and be together forever. Wishing to be together forever will not make it so. No other ceremony or contract will make it so. If I could speak to each man or woman who longs for marriage, but has not yet found their eternal companion, I would urge you not to wait until marriage to be endowed in the house of the Lord. Begin now to learn and experience what it means to be armed with priesthood power. And to each of you who has made temple covenants, I plead with you to seek prayerfully and consistently to understand temple covenants and ordinances. Spiritual doors will open. You will learn how to part the veil between heaven and earth, how to ask for God's angels to attend you, and how better to receive direction from heaven. Your diligent efforts to do so will reinforce and strengthen your spiritual foundation. My dear brothers and sisters, when renovations on the Salt Lake Temple are completed, there will be no safer place during an earthquake in the Salt Lake Valley than inside that temple. Likewise, whenever any kind of upheaval occurs in your life, the safest place to be spiritually is living inside your temple covenants. Please believe me when I say that when your spiritual foundation is built solidly upon Jesus Christ, you have no need to fear. As you are true to your covenants made in the temple, you will be strengthened by His power. Then when spiritual earthquakes occur, you will be able to stand strong because your spiritual foundation is solid and immovable. I love you, dear brothers and sisters. These truths I know. God, our Heavenly Father, wants you to choose to come home to Him his plan of eternal progression is not complicated. 
and it honors your agency. You are free to choose who you will be and with whom you will be in the world to come. God lives. Jesus is the Christ. This is his church, restored to help you fulfill your divine destiny. I so testify in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our dear, loving Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the opportunity we have to meet together, to feel thy spirit. We're grateful for the opportunity we have to hear from our living prophets and apostles and to witness ongoing revelation in this time of restoration. Father, we pray humbly that thou would help us to center our lives on thy Son, Jesus Christ, that we would make and keep sacred covenants in his house. We ask thee that we would have the courage and power and faith to take the impressions that we have received this day and to put them into action in our lives. We thank thee for the many, many blessings we enjoy and do so in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. 
This has been a broadcast of the Sunday morning session of the 191st Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Speakers were selected from leaders of the church. Music for this session was provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. This broadcast has been furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. <laughs>